this was quite a watershed moment for Victoria Police. It um, forced Victoria Police into a position where we had to stop and look at um, how we were dealing with a whole host of our engagement issues, which was, um, whilst it was enormously painful and quite expensive for us, um, it was something that needed to be done. So once again, I recognise the work of Daniel Hale, Michael and the other people to actually test Victoria Police and challenge us. You're watching The World From Below and we're speaking with Sophie Ellis from the Police Accountability Project and Reem from Amara Advocacy. That clip we just showed was of former Victorian Police Chief Ken Lay discussing the racial profiling case we turn to now. The case of Hale Michael and Constantinidis settled in February 2013 with a landmark agreement for Victoria Police to publicly review its training and practices in stopping people in public and recording their personal information. Sophie, can you tell us a bit about this case? Yeah, sure. So the case was run by um, in the federal court by quite a few young men who had been racially profiled by police, so repeatedly stopped on the basis of the colour of their skin and um, questioned but also subjected to um, actions of police violence over many years. Um, and the case was um, unprecedented in its settlement, so um, it ended up with a settlement where police committed to um, a three-year action plan, as you said, um, which is called the Equality is Not the Same report. Um, and one of the um, important part of our work now is seeing how that is being rolled out by Victoria Police and, you know, how committed they are and um, in implementing the actions that they spoke of in that report. Reem, did you want to talk a bit about that case? Um, what do we mean when we talk about racial profiling? Um, I guess, well, it it's basically um, race being a proxy for criminality. So criminalising a person based on their race or religious, you know, because of their religion um, and stopping in, and it could manifest in many ways, such as stopping and searching someone, um, uh, I guess, you know, um, imposing like using excessive force and, and which, yeah, which obviously can manifest in many other ways. So yeah, that's what racial profiling is, you know, um, using race as a basis to criminalise someone. And it is a real problem. I mean, one of the really fascinating things that came out of the case and really problematic things is evidence that was led by the plaintiffs which showed that um, people in the Flemington, Kensington area, young men of colour, were two and a half times more likely to be stopped than um, others, even though statistically they were less likely to commit crimes. Mm. So there's your evidence of racial profiling. It's a significant issue for police um, to combat, which Victoria Police has acknowledged. Um, why do you think it happens? <sighs> That's a really hard question. Um, I think because of racism. Yeah. And I think, you know, Australia really has to reconcile with that. Um, there's no real reason for people to be stopped because of the colour of their skin except for racism. And people, um, as Reem was saying, um, associating criminality with um, blackness or any other kind of um, feature. So, I mean... Do you, do you think they knew it was happening, for example, or do you think it's unconscious to a certain degree? I mean, to what extent do you think that bringing the case highlighted a problem that perhaps police didn't think they actually had? I think the problem of racial profiling has been present throughout Australia's history and throughout the, you know, um, you know, through, colon through the beginning when you know this country was colonised till till now, um, the history of Flemington in itself, um, before you know the Horn of Africans migrated, which was like in the 80s. So we've been here for a while, but before that was Indo Chinese and um, Turkish and Central Americans and you know um, other members from you know other communities of colour who were being subject to pro policing and profiling. Um, and this is, you know, I think documented, if you, you could read stuff on that. And, you know, we are the new wave of migrants that came in and we're now being subject to the same sort of policing. Um, a lot of those migrants have left. So I think it's it's been present in the history. It's been present in the history. It's just that this case kind of brought this to the fore, to the forefront, you know. And it's obviously an ongoing problem that, you know, is continuing to manifest itself across the country, um, particularly in Indigenous communities who have been subject to this for a very long time. Mm. And you see it now in the Northern Territory laws, um, which have been relatively recently enacted, that allow for the so-called paperless arrest. Mm. So um, detaining people without 
um, any um, suspicion that they've you know, committed an offence. Um, it's a real problem. Um, I think, going back to your question, it's a mixture. You know, I think there is some really overt strains of racism, um, but I think there's also um, a, a cultural shift that needs to happen and, a, as you say, an awareness. And I think they work together um, and both need to be confronted. It is obviously quite difficult to prove that it's going on. I mean, you've given the stat of two and a half times more likely to mm. be stopped. But what, what kind of things do you have to lead before a court to say that this is a cultural issue within the police that we call racial profiling? Yeah, it is really, really difficult to prove. And of course, you know, you need resources to prove it too. Yeah. I mean, getting expert evidence to establish um, racial profiling is going on and to st statistically analyse stops by police. Um, is so is that what you do? You look at all the stops and work out? That's right. Wow. So police are required um, to... Um, um, sorry. sorry. Um, police are required to collect um, um, information when they stop a person. Um, it's called a field report and um, that data has to be analysed, um, well it wasn't analysed in this, this particular case. Um, I think uh, one way of highlighting how difficult it is, is um, there was a Supreme Court decision that came down at the end of the last year, um, DPP in Carba, mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court um, held in that case that police have a right to stop um, a car at random without suspicion of an offence being committed under the Road Safety Act or any other um, piece of legislation or under the common law and detain that vehicle um, and ask the driver for their licence, do checks. Now there's already power to do that under other legislation, other provisions. The, the thing with this one is that there's no basis for the stop. So it's purportedly a stop at random, but it really undermines, you know, um, efforts to combat racial profiling because a person has no way to challenge that. Mm. And if you're a young person who's been stopped 15 times in the past month um, from an African background or you're a young person from an Indigenous background who's been stopped 15 times in the last month and you say, my friends who are white haven't been stopped 15 times in the la mm. last month, what's going on? Well, it's pretty clear what's going on. But how you prove that in the court when police have a power, an unfettered power to stop with no suspicion is really problematic. You're watching The World From Below and we'll be back after this short break to talk about how we can improve police accountability.